always good to be back. All right. So let me kind of tell you where we're going the next 30 minutes or so. My wife and I are tag teaming the sermon, okay? So I'm going to do point number one and point number three, and the best part of the sermon will be point two when she comes up in just a little bit, okay? So we're going to just talk about uh, our values at our church, what's really important, what, what God has spoke to us 21 years ago, where we're going in the future. Anybody interested? All right, so why don't you grab your copy of God's Word, and um, I just want to share one verse out of the Bible. There'll be a couple other verses up on the screen in a little bit, uh, but again, I preach way better when you respond, so lean up in your seat, sit forward, be ready to give me a couple amens and hallelujahs and wave your handkerchief, swing from a chandelier or two, and let's get after it. Let's get after it. Psalm chapter 90, I want to look at one verse there, Psalm chapter 90 and verse 12. We're going to read there in just a second, so make some noise if you found Psalm 90. Okay, so that tells me not everybody is there. It's right in the middle of your Bible, Psalm 90, and we're going to uh, read it, verse 12, in just a second. Uh, got tw uh, come on, I've been stalling for you to find it. Psalm 90, verse 12. You got it? All right, so before we read that, I want you to look this way. I want to ask you a question. How many of you in the room are uh, UFC fans? You know what UFC is? Ultimate Fighting Championship. Where are my UFC? I'm talking men and women alike. Ladies, men, raise your hand. Keep your hand up really high. These are the real Christians in our church right now. Come on, let me see your hand. Get your hand all the way. You should be proud of that. UFC, I love that. UFC, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're like, it's a little barbaric. It's a little violent. Pastor Steve, you should not be watching that. I don't approve of that. Well, you try preaching four services. I need something violent when I go home. And uh, I can't be watching some romantic movie or something. I need some blood and guts and arms being bent and broken in the name of Jesus. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so where are my UFC fans? Let's make some noise. So I, I love this guy, uh, Bruce Buffer. He, he's the announcer. And so they get into the cage. One guy's on one side, one guy's on the other. He gets his mic and he just says two words. Do you know what the words are? It's... But he doesn't just go, it's time. It's like, it's like, it's time! And I'm just like on my couch, like, I can't wait, it's gonna be awesome! And it's like, it's time for what? Well, it's time to, it's time to get the, the action started. And, and we've come to church, my wife and I, to let you know, it is also time. It's time. Here's what's cool about an anniversary or a birthday party as a church or as an individual. It, it allows you and it spurs you to look back on where you've come from the last 21 years and also to remind the church not only where we came from, but where we're headed as well. So we're going to talk about three really important values. It's time, it's time, it's time. Here, here's the purpose, to get all of us in alignment to what God's doing. Right. Alignment, say, say alignment. alignment. I told you the story, uh, didn't I, when my car was out of alignment in college. I lived in Westlake Village, and I was thinking, 101 North, you know where that, 101 North, 23 Freeway that takes you out to Moore Park, you know where that's at? I, my car was so out of alignment when I got to that uh, on-ramp or off-ramp, I actually took my hands off of the wheel, and it made the turn for me. <laughs> and I don't know jack about cars. I'm like, hey, what, what happened? And my friend said, your car's out of alignment, Dumbo. So I took it in and I got in alignment. How I many know if we're not careful as a church, we could be quick to get out of alignment? God spoke some things to us 21 years ago and praise God for what he spoke, but we gotta stay in alignment. Otherwise, we're gonna find ourselves in a month or a year out of alignment. And how I many we can grow and we can reach the city, but if we're not in alignment for what God wants to do, then we find ourselves in a lot of trouble. So say the word with me again, alignment, alignment. Here's what's true about your car when it gets out of alignment. It doesn't happen when you go over one pot, right? One, 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 one hole in the, it, it happens over weeks and months, sometimes even years, and eventually you wake up and like, my car's jacked up, right? And if we're not careful as a church or a business, an organization, your family, you gotta make sure you stay in alignment. So the psalmist says in uh, Psalm 90, look at your Bibles there, verse 12, he says, teach us to do what? To Look at your Bible. The teach us to number our days. Check this out. This isn't like, hey, pull out your calendar and, and check up Monday. Oh, praise God, Monday's over and Tuesday. I can't wait till Friday. You're just, no, that's not. Teach us to number our days is saying, hey, God, make sure that I uh, have the priority. Every single day is important and profitable for me. I'm not just checking the calendar, but I want to maximize. Here it is. I want to maximize every day that you give me. Teach me to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. The Living Bible says, teach us to number our days and recognize they are few. And do we have any parents in the house? Parents, do you realize how fast your kids grow up? It's crazy. I cannot believe we have three kids in our 20s. It's amazing. I can't believe I'm 43 years old now. <laughs> what are you laughing for, man? 
Ushers, take him out of the building right now. No, I'm, I'm 53, but I can't believe I'm 50. Like 53 sounds crazy. I'm here on Wednesday night with our youth, and I'm like hugging these kids. I'm like three times as old as them. I don't feel 53. I feel like 33. But where has the time gone? 21 years ago, we started our church. Are you kidding me? My wife and I have been married for 29 years. 29 years. You should be clapping for her. Next year is our big 3-0. 3-0. You're sending us to Italy. Um, uh, where's the time gone? So God, God teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Not just to flip pages on a calendar, but to maximize the opportunities that you give us. God, it's time to do three things. Ready? It's time, number one, write this down. It's time to, you ready? It's time to, write this down. It's time, number one, to give. It's time to give. Someone say give. Yes. Oh, here we go, Marcia. They're going to talk about giving in the church. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. I, I got to talk about giving because the Bible talks more about giving than heaven and hell combined. It's time to give, like it's time for us to give our lives radically, fully sold out lives for Jesus Christ. It's, it's time to stop playing games. You just kind of have one foot in the world and one foot in the church. It's time to be all in for God. How many know that Jesus went all in for us? It's, it, it's time to stop playing spiritual games and it's time to go radical, committed life in Jesus Christ. It's time to get serious. It's time to put our past behind us. It's time to get radical for Jesus Christ because the days are evil. It's time to maximize the opportunity. It's time to give. Well, I'm not, I'm not really sure if I want to be that all in. Like, I, I just like coming to the church once in a while, and I like, because sometimes he's even funny, and I really like the worship here. The worship's amazing. I, uh, that's about it. I don't really want to do anything more than just kind of come once in a while and sing some songs. I want to build a Jesus. You ever been to Build-A-Bear? My son loved Build-A-Bear. Finally, like ninth grade, we're like, you can't go there anymore. <laughs> and uh, so you get your little outright, and you get to build your bear. You get to build your animal. You get to put the things together. And, and often Christians are like that. They want to build Jesus to his liking. And he's like, no, die to yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. And so we need to, we need, it's time to give every aspect of our life, our finances, our time, our talent, our treasure, to give it all to Jesus because he gave it all to us. So it's time. Someone say, it's time. It's time to give. Give what? Well, a couple things I want you to write down. Number one, it's time to give generously. The word is generous. God loves a cheerful giver. God loves a cheerful. Listen, when the buckets go by and you're just like, oh, this is stupid. Don't give then. God loves a cheerful giver. It's a blessing. It's, a, it's an amazing thing to give back to this amazing God who's given us so much. To give, the word is generously. Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You know what giving is? Giving is more about a heart issue than it is a money issue. So check this out. Only 17% of Christians across the United States tithe. I thought I'd get more of a response. You guys are, didn't have enough cappuccino, I can tell. So let me say it again, then you respond how you should. Only 17% of Christians tithe. You're like, well, where's, where's new life? We got to be better than like the national average. Yeah, just a little bit, 25% of us. So when I hear, when I hear that only 25% of the people that go to this church, I'm not talking about new people. I'm not talking about this is your first or second or third time. I'm talking about you've been here six months or longer. When I hear as a pastor, only 25% of the people are giving financially. There's a bunch of emotions. I, I have thoughts. You want to hear my thoughts? Number one, I'm like really sad. I'm really sad. I'm really sad for you because you think... You think by holding on 100% or 98%, you think you're going to be better off without God than you are with God. So I'm sad for you. Honestly, I'm really sad for you because God says if you'll give to him, he'll open up the windows of heaven. So I'm sad for you because when you hold on to what belongs to God, he says, I'm closing the doors financially. I'm not, I can't bless you. I want to, but I can't. So I'm sad for you, and I'm mad. Not mad at you, I'm mad at the devil that's lie, but believed you, uh, that you, you believed his trick, his lie, and you believe he's lied to you. I'm mad at the devil that's convinced you that, that 90% with God is way better than 100% on your own. And then I think about, here's another emotion. I, the other emotion I have is like, I, what would happen if not 25%, but 100% of us gave? What, here's, here's the thing, the, what kind of, damage can we do to hell 
What can we do in our city? What can we do? What, what would happen if 100% of us said, hey, I'm all in, I'm giving 10%. Hey, we can build a men's home, a women's home for people coming off of drugs, addicts. We can build a gymnasium. We, let, we could buy this building. We could buy another building. Hey, what can we do if 100%? I'm sad that only 25% of us. Here's another emotion I feel. I feel like a sense of, it's not fair. I, I feel like a sense of injustice. If you have four kids at your house and only one kid does all the chores for the three others and they just sit there and play video games, I'm ticked off that the one kid has to do all the chores for the other three sitting around doing nothing. There's something rises up in me. But only 25, aren't we family? Are we family? Then I would say it's not fair for three-fourths of us not to do what God's called them to do. Man, what can we do in our city? What buildings can we build? What kinds of people can we reach? How can we rescue sex, uh, ladies caught in sex trafficking? And sometimes it costs money. You're like, well, what do they do with the money anyhow? We're just going to look around. We used to have a, when we first started the church, we had a slide, like a little slide projector. Remember you put the words on it with this little thing? And now we have an LED screen. Do you know that this stuff costs money? And it costs money to put on electricity and air conditioning, and it costs money to hire people and then to give them health insurance, and it costs money to, to go to Africa, and it costs money to go to Spain, and it costs money to do Second Saturday Outreach, and it costs money to do that. And we need to give generously. And I know you're not really excited about that, so I'll go on to the second point right now. We need to give generously. Number two, we need to serve sacrificially. We need to serve sacrificially. Give generously, serve sacrificially. So 25% of the people... Would you be bummed if you found out that 75% of the marriages at New Life were falling apart? Would you want to do something about it? What if you found out that 75% of the kids in our church are being abused by their parents? Would you just sit back and say, well, that's their deal? And 75%, we just asked you to rise up to give generously, number two, to serve sacrificially. Check out what this verse says. I love this verse. Jesus said in Luke chapter 2, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are are few. Here's the assumption, because we have a large church, you could just walk in and say, well, they're all set. They don't need any help. That's a lie. We have five or 600 volunteers, but you know what? It takes a lot of people to do four services. It takes a lot of people to serve 4,000 people. We need more of everything all the time. We need more people in children's ministry. We need more ushers. We need more greeters. We need more people in hospitality. We need more people to come in and, and, and volunteer, vacuum, stuff the bullets, and you fill in the blank. We need more people in the production booth so it's not the same people over and over and over and over and over serving. You're like, well... I served at one time. I I put my six months in. Is that what you would tell your kid at 13? He's like, I'm done. I'm not doing chores anymore. I've been doing chores for 13 years. We got to step up. Give generously. We need to serve. The workers are, the workers are few. Check this out. Ephesians 2.10 says, we are God's handiwork or masterpiece. Created in Christ Jesus. Here it is. To do good works, which God prepared in advance for, to do, to do, to do. There are some things God wants us to do. Anybody like Wikipedia? I like Wikipedia. It makes me seem really smart. <laughs> Somebody's like, hey, Pastor Steve, what do you think about this? I'm like, hold on a sec. Type up Wikipedia. And uh, check this out. You know this when Wikipedia started many years ago? Here's, here, here was the goal of Wikipedia. Let's find the experts. Let's find the scholars. Let's find the professional people. Have them write an article on medicine, on science, on whatever, geography. And have them spend a lot of time writing an article. And then we'll publish it on Wikipedia. Check this out. After three years of using professionals, the, they, they came up with 24 articles after three years. The owners of Wikipedia are like, this is going to take forever. So what they did is they said, forget about it. We're not using the experts. We're not using the scholars. We're just going to release and empower the ordinary people. So, hey, if you have a passion for a country and you want to write about that, great. If you have a passion for science and you want to write about that. And they started releasing and empowering the general person, not the scholar, not the expert, to use the gift, the passion that they have. And check this out. In three years, they produced 24 articles with experts. And check this out. In less than a year, 20,000 articles were written. You say, well, where, where is Wikipedia at today? I can tell you where they're at. They've written over 57 million articles just in English alone. Why? They empowered the per- just the average person to say, hey, I release you in the name of Jesus. Anybody see a connection with the illustration I'm using? I think there should be a revolution in our church where we come to the conclusion it's just not the people on the platform doing the ministry. 
It's the everyday person. Listen, you are full time. You're called, you're anointed. God wants to use you in your gifting. And please, this will help me out. When you, when you see a need, don't come to this conclusion. I got to call the church. We need help. No, you are the church. Yep. I got to call the church. The church, who are you talking about? When you say you're calling, who are you talking about? We only have like 20 people on staff. You're thinking about firemen that sleep at the fire station and come down a pole and they go, no, no, you are the church. Point to the church. I'm the church. If you're passionate about girls caught in sex trafficking, I release you. If you're passionate about getting kids off of drugs, opioids, addiction, I release you. I'm not saying you're going to preach or lead worship, but I, I release you. You're pa- Listen, God's gifted you. God's called you. God's anointed you. I release you. You want to start a Bible study at your work? You want to, you, there's homelessness? I, I release you in the name of Jesus. What has God appointed you and anointed you and called you to do? I release you as your pastor to serve sacrificially. Can somebody make some noise in this church? So here's the pushback. Yeah, that's good. I, I, yeah, I need to start giving. I need to start serving. When? When, when I get a real job, when I get a new job, when I get a better job. Then I'm serious. I'm like, count me in, Pastor. When? When? When what? Well, when I get married. I've been single, and I'm trying to set up when. When I get married. When? Then you get married. Then when we have kids. Then when our kids move out. Then when I get a different job, and then when I move to a bigger house, and when I buy the car of my dreams, and here's what I've discovered about when and then people. When never ends, and then never comes. So today is the day. It's time today to start giving and serving passionately, which brings me and my wife an awesome opportunity and privilege to honor all of the volunteers in our church. So if, you're, if you help in children's ministry, worship ministry, you serve in any capacity at our church, you're on the church council, you're on our staff, I want you to stand to your feet right now. We want to recognize you. We want to honor and we want to thank God. Come on, stand to your feet. Don't look around and say, should I be standing? If you serve in any capacity, go ahead and stand up. And I want you to make some crazy noise for these people that have stood to their feet. And we, got, we give God thanks and praise for each and every one of you. Come on, I can't hear you. Make some noise. We honor you. We love you. And we could not do it without you. You may be seated. Everybody say hello to the first lady of the church. Amen. We love you. We thank you. We appreciate you. You guys make new life, new life. You know, in 21 years, we've seen a lot of growth. Our family has grown. Steve mentioned our kids are all in their 20s now. And when we started our church, we left a solid paycheck with three kids under the age of four to go and follow the call of God on our life. And we have never looked back. It has been an exciting, there's been highs and lows, but we are so thankful. In fact, I have a picture of our of our family at New Life's first Easter and then last Easter. Our three kids, Riley, Brenna, and Ryan. This is Ryan's first birthday that he's missed. He's interning in South Carolina. And actually, we sent him, or he went off to Georgia for the weekend to get away from the storm. So hopefully things will are settled down so he can go back. But our family has grown, and um, our church has grown. We went from 40 people who said, we're going to go with you. We're going to follow God's call to around 4,000 people call New Life their home. In fact, some of those 40 people are in the room today and their sacrifice and prayers um, have made New Life what it is. We had a great foundation. Our buildings are grown. We started with no building. We rented the residence in. We were there for a few years and then moved into our building on C Street. It was 14,000 square feet. We love that building. It was our first church home, and we loved it. We used it, we filled it, and then we moved um, here about seven years ago, and this building is 45,000 square feet. Just to show you a comparison, we started with one service, went to two, went to three, and now we're at four service, and we are bursting at the seams. This building gets used every night of the week, and it's so exciting what God is doing in our church every day. Day of the week. Whether we like it or not, time does not stand still. Steve said he's 53, but I have some good news for the ladies that 
um, actually, I have heard, and I believe it, that um, 50 is the new 40, so we all get a whole nother decade. It's true. But I am in awe of all that God has done. And every year we celebrate and we give God all the glory. We want it to be less of us and more of him every year that goes by. But we're also celebrating this morning that the best is yet to come. God's not done yet. Our latter days are gonna be greater than our former. So new life, one thing that it's time for us to do is to keep growing. We need to grow in our walk with Jesus. Second Peter 3.18 says, but grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. I remember a Bible college professor, he spent the entire summer studying the book of Jude, which is one chapter. He had been teaching for probably 30 years. So as, as Christians, we never arrive. We're always growing. We're always maturing, always conforming to the image of Christ Jesus. Growing spiritually is not just a good idea. It's not a suggestion, a recommendation. It's a command. It's a mandate for our lives. We are either growing in Jesus or we're not. You can't be going forward and standing still at the same time. Revelation says that we are either hot or cold. But, and, and this is a strong word. He says, because you are lukewarm, neither hot or cold, I will spew you out of my mouth. Think of spit, think of vomit, think of Dr. Pimple Popper. It is not a pretty picture of God's view of lukewarmness. Sometimes we like the idea of God changing other people, God changing our circumstances more than we like the idea of God changing us. We think the problem is our spouse or our kids. If only they were, our lives would be better. But God wants to change us. He wants us to keep growing. <laughs> Hebrews 6, 11 says, let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taken into maturity. God's goal for our lives is not just to slide into heaven, barely making it. He wants us to walk right in, mature, faithful followers of Jesus Christ. Why do we need to grow? because the enemy of our souls doesn't want us to. Why we need to grow is because my husband needs a wife that's fully devoted to Jesus Christ. My kids need a mom that's gonna go to Jesus for them. They need to see Christ in me. I need to raise Christ followers, so I need to keep growing in order to help lead my family. My church and my city needs to see me grow. You can't watch the news for five minutes without recognizing that our world desperately needs a savior. And he wants us to be witnesses in this world. Ephesians 4.14 in the New Living Testament says, then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick, trick us with lies so clever it sounds like the truth. We need to grow because the enemy of our soul, his main purpose his, is to um, seek us out to devour us. And he will use anything and anyone. He distracts us. He keeps us busy. He keeps us feeling defeated. We see every day how the enemy will use um, shows on TV, commercials, music, mu movies, well-meaning people. He will... Sh desensitizes so much that the lies sound like truth. But I have good news. God is more than enough. Greater is in me than he that is in the world. I know the truth and his name is Jesus and he's ready to set us free. New life, we need to keep growing. The call of God on our life and our church is so big that it needs all of us to be growing and moving forward in Jesus Christ. I want to invite you just to turn your notes over, and I'm going to give you seven points that are New Life's Guide to Growth. Get, get your pen out and start writing these down. New Life's Guide to Growth. The first one is daily devotions. Daily devotions are setting time aside to be alone with God, to read the word, to pray. 
In our bookstore, we sell journals. And in that journal, it has two reading plans, an extended reading and a simplified plan. And so the idea is to, every day you check off the, your reading plan, you read so you find a scripture that stands out to you. Write the scripture down, an observation, how it's gonna apply to my life in a prayer. But you know what, if that's too much, we're not trying to make you fit into a mold. Start with one chapter, start with two verses, start somewhere. You know, in Hebrews it says that the word of God is alive and active. I know when I feel defeated that this book here tells me that he is the glory and the lifter of my head. When I'm afraid of the future or a diagnosis or what's going to come, this book tells me that he has not given me a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. When I feel alone, he says that he will never, ever leave me nor forsake me. He will stick closer than a brother. His love is never ending. He forgives my sins, heals my diseases. This book is alive. It speaks to us. It tells us God's heart. It gives us wisdom. It helps us to know which way to turn and where to go. Be in the book. Number two is weekly worship. Hebrews 10, 25 says, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another. Weekly worship, coming to church is so important. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We're gonna be here unless we're sick or we're on vacation. We're gonna be in the house of the Lord. You know what? like you there's some Sundays or first Wednesdays that I'm like oh I've been so busy I don't really feel like coming to church my attitude is a little bit bad but when I walk in here among people that I love and I hear the worship something happens in my spirit I'm encouraged I'm changed I'm lifted up and then I can leave here a different woman than when I walked in being in the house of the Lord Sometimes I look around at you and I see what God, I remember what God has done in your life. And I think, Lord Jesus, thank you that I get the opportunity to worship and be in a church family called New Life because you guys are amazing and what God has done is incredible. The third thing is water baptism. Saying yes to Jesus is the best decision you'll make in your life. It's not an easy decision, but it's the best decision. And so the next step after that is to be water baptized. So there'll be one coming up in October, so sign up. Number four is pray often. Talk to God just like we're talking here. Let your requests be made known to him. Before, on your way into a meeting or to take a test, pray under your, your breath, Lord Jesus, be with me. Give me the words to say. Give me wisdom. Help me to know what you want me to do here. God, invite God into every aspect of your life. He wants to be in relationship with you. And it happens when we're in prayer and talking to him and listening to, for him as well. Number five is life groups. It was in our announcements today. Life groups are our small groups, and we believe life is better together. We're a pretty big church, and so sometimes it's hard to get to know people, but in a life group, in a smaller group of people, you can develop a community, some friends, you can pray for one each another, study the word, pray. It's a great thing, so make sure you check into that. Also, number six is training for life. Training for Life is our discipleship program. There's three levels, and each class and every level is taught by either our pastors or some awesome leaders. And I can't say enough good things about Training for Life. It's awesome. You'll start off in level one with the foundations of your faith. Level two will take you into learning about spiritual warfare and the person and the power of the Holy Spirit. They're awesome classes. And then level three is um, all about spiritual, uh, emotional, healthy spirituality. And that class will take, will give you a whole new way to think and to live and your emotional health and your spiritual health go hand in hand. 
These classes, I'm telling you, are amazing. And they're interactive. So you will sit at tables with other believers and you'll get to ask questions. Whereas on Sunday, we don't have that opportunity. So it's really powerful. Then last but not least is number seven, our New Life Institute. And our New Life Institute taught by... <laughs> You know what, this is just taking your faith and just study of God's word in a different direct, in another direction. They um, are college like classes that are practical, that are for people, not just that love school, but that love Jesus and want to see their lives grow. So if you have any questions, you can go to the table in the lobby, you can call the church office, but we just want to see you take one thing. What is the one thing God is asking you to do? It may feel overwhelming like, oh, I got to do all seven. Not all at once. But what is God asking you to do? If you're not reading at all, we'll start reading one chapter a day. Start praying. Start writing them down. If you're doing your devotions and you're doing good, well, then maybe you need to do training for life or the institute. But prayerfully consider if all of us take one step forward in our walk with the Lord, we're all moving towards the image of Christ Jesus, then what's going to happen in the life of our church, in our city, in our families? So new life, let's keep growing and see what God will do. She's on fire. I did notice there were way more amens when she was preaching. <laughs> so I'm out of here, man. So good. Time to give, time to grow. Number three, G, G. Let me think of another, I can't think of another word with G. Time to, what did you say? God? No, it's not. It is time for God, but not, that's not the outline. It's time to, want to take a guess, two letters. It's time to, excellent, excellent. That sounds good. Let's go ahead and make that the fill in the blank. It's time to go. Come on, someone say go. go. Hey, where exactly are we going? Well, Jesus said, check out this verse. Jesus said in, what's the verse? I lost it. John 4, 35. He said, don't say four more months and then comes the harvest. I tell you, turn to your neighbor and say, open your eyes. He says, don't say four more months and then the harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. We need to open up our eyes. We need to look. I got a question for you. How, how many years ago did Jesus say that? Did he say that last year? Five years ago, 10 years ago, 100 years ago? 2,000 years ago, he said, as he looked upon the fields, they were white or ripe for harvest. If that was true, and it was 2,000 years ago, if it was true that 2,000 years ago the harvest was white, how much whiter and more ripe is it today? We just have to open up our eyes. We need to look. When you go to work, look, there's people all around you that don't know Jesus. When you go to school, open your eyes, look around. There's people that don't know Jesus. When you go to a family reunion, you almost lose your mind because those people drive you crazy. <laughs> open your eyes and look because the harvest is ripe. You know, Nick Vujicic is part of our church now. He's like a world-renowned evangelist. He was in the second service. And, and I, sometimes I think, man, if I could just get Nick who is an evangelist, to come to my family, to come to my work, to come to my job, to come to my school, and let Nick give it. And it's not going to happen that way. God is, wants to use you. Listen, your gift, your ability, your talent, your personality, you don't have to be an evangelist. The Bible says, do the work of an evangelist. God's going to use your temperament, your personality, your words, your influence, and you're saying, well, I'm kind of scared. Listen, I am too. Sometimes you don't know what to say or how to say it. That's why Jesus said, before I gave you, before I said, go and tell, he says, all authority has been given to you. So we don't go alone. We go with the person and the power and the work of the Holy Spirit. As we go, open up your eyes because God wants to save the people around you. Turn to somebody and say, go and tell. Go and tell. I want to be honest with you. Um, I'm seeing all this, all these houses and apartments go up in our city and Camarillo and it's just like everywhere in Ventura and the Holy House and all I think, more traffic, are you sick of it? And God just really convicted me a couple of weeks ago. Would you, would you stop looking at 
how you're going to be inconvenienced by the traffic and start looking at the opportunities of people coming to Jesus Christ and being a part of our church family. And stop looking at how it's going to inconvenience you and start looking at how God wants to save and rescue more people. And we need to, Matthew 28, 19, again, he said, I want you to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Don't be weird. Don't be obnoxious. Don't be in your face. Don't be pushy. Just use the gifts that God's given you and go into all the world. Here's my goal. I want us as a congregation to populate heaven and put hell out of business. That's it. That's it. And let me tell you, four services is not very convenient. Do you think my wife and I sit around on like Friday night and we're like, hey, what else can we do on Sunday? Let's add another service. I just want to tell you, this is what I would really like. I would like this to happen. I would like us to have one service at 10 o'clock. Doesn't that sound great? You just sleep in, I don't know, I could sleep in about 8.30 or so, maybe go get a bite to eat, a little coffee, show up about 9, there one service, preach for 45 minutes and go home. All my staff is like, amen, hallelujah, right? And that'd be awesome, 10 o'clock out of here at 11.30, we can catch the football game by 1 o'clock, right? Doesn't that sound great? We don't sit around and say, hey, what, we, we don't have enough going on on Monday, what else can we do? Hey, I got an idea, let's start another service. People say, isn't our church big enough? That's a dumb question, that's the wrong question. You never wanna ask the question, isn't our church big enough? That's the bad question, it's the wrong question. The question is, do we want anybody going to hell? Do we wanna leave anybody behind? No, we don't want to, so whether it's four services, five services, six services, God, whatever you want us to do, we'll keep growing because you love lost people. Luke chapter 19, verse 10, Jesus came to seek and save those that were lost. I'm gonna, I'm gonna clap myself, that's good preaching right there. Seek and save that which was lost, lost, lost. And if we can tie everything we do to a soul, everybody that volunteers, tie everything we do to a soul, you're not just serving in children's ministry. You're not just changing a diaper. You're not just playing an instrument. You're not just sitting behind a camera. You gotta tie that assignment to a soul. If you're watching somebody's kid in children's ministry and somebody comes in this service for the first time and says yes to Jesus Christ, wouldn't it have been worth it for you to spend 75 minutes in a classroom while that mom and dad come to life in Jesus Christ? Hey, I know you get, you get some beef as an usher or a greeter and people give you attitudes, but listen, if you could put your attitude away and just serve to the best of your ability because that person could have just came out of a divorce or something. They could have had a really bad night. They, their husband just left them the night before. But if they come on Sunday morning and they see that you love God and that you love them and they come to life in Jesus Christ, wouldn't it be worth it for somebody to give you an attitude if they come to life in Jesus Christ? So let's stop complaining and let's go into all the world and preach the gospel. Check it out. So go and tell. Someone say go and tell. Here's another great strategy for evangelism. Go and tell. The second one is come and see. Come and see. Check out this, uh, these verses. John chapter 1, verse 43. It's coming up on the screen. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Notice this, finding Philip. What did he do? He, he found Philip. He said to him, follow me. Philip, uh, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael. Jesus found Philip. Philip found Nathanael. Jesus found Philip. Philip found Nathanael. Found people, find people. Found people, find people. And he told them, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote. Jesus of Nazareth, son of Joseph, Nazareth. Can anything good come from there? Nathanael said, what? Come and, I gotta be honest, sometimes people ask me a question, if God really loved me, why did he allow my 13-year-old kid to die? If God really loved me, why did he take my mother at 48 or 50 years old? I don't know all the answers to those questions. I do know that God is absolutely sovereign and in control. So how many of people try to debate you at work and well, God did this and God did that and look at those hypocrite Christians and look at that pastor, he stole money and, and what about, I don't, I don't know all the answers to that. But sometimes you say, I don't, I don't know, those are great questions. I'll do my best to try to research it and get back to you. But listen, just, would you come to a service with me? Would you come to a first Wednesday with me? Would you come to a Wednesday night youth meeting with me? Would you go to a class with me? I, I don't know. And let me know when they show up at church with their questions and they get in an environment where the presence of God is here and the worship team just kills it. You don't even have to say anything. Like, I, I don't know about all your questions. I don't have any ber verses memorized. I can't defend like a lot of the stuff that I believe. I don't know doctrine that well. I can't debate theology, but just, would you just come to a service? How many know when they come to the service, God just gets a hold of their heart and they come to life in Jesus Christ? 
I, I want to I ask you this question. How many in the last 21 years came to this church and you received Jesus, not because I went to your office or your school and invited you to come, but somebody else in our church invited you to come here, you came here and you got saved. Right now I want you to stand to your feet, if that was you. Somebody in our church invited you, you came to the church and you got saved. Don't applaud yet, I want you to stand up. So somebody invited you, I, I, I didn't, okay? Uh, just look around. This is, in the four services, this is the least amount of people that we've had. So somebody invited you, a friend, a family member, a cousin, an aunt, an uncle, somebody that you work with, and you came and you received Jesus Christ because of an invitation. So I, I, would, I, I would say a couple of things. Number one, praise God for how God used the other person in your life. Now I'm saying to you that are standing, now you are to go, now that you're found, right? You're found. Now you need to go find some people and just say, hey, I don't know, I can't answer all your questions. Just, would you come to one service with me? And they might not come for a couple of weeks or a few months or a few years, but when they come, then they're gonna encounter the same God that you encountered. So I empower you, I release you to do what was done for you. Can we give God thanks for these that are standing right now? You may be seated there. Go and tell, come and see. Go and tell, come and see. So we're 40 people, wow, to 4,000 people, wow. But what if we keep inviting and what if people keep coming and what if people keep getting saved? This place is gonna look different. It's gonna look different. It's gonna be, I, I promise you, this will always be a very uncomfortable place. You're gonna have to wait in line to check your kid in. You're gonna park across the street. Can you imagine that across the street? I know people like walk an hour in Africa to get to a service. I had to walk across the street. It was so Hot in there today. What, what the temp? What was it? We set the AC at 69 instead of 67 for you. I'm sorry. It's going to be really uncomfortable. We're going to ask you to serve and give. It's going to be super uncomfortable. We're going to keep adding service. Really uncomfortable. We're going to ask you to get involved. Incredibly uncomfortable. But I also promise you, people are going to come to Jesus. Miracles are going to take place. Healings are going to take place. People are going to come out of addiction. Marriages are going to like, they're hopeless. There's no way God's going to mend all those things. We got to get out of our comfort zone and let God do what he wants to do. It's going to look different in a year or two. I was looking at my notes just from four or five years ago. We were, we were about 1,800, 2,000 people. Now we're over 3,000 every weekend. And who knows, in a year we might be at four or five. And I don't know. I don't know, like, we, honestly, in the natural, we can't afford to buy this building. Cannot. And you're like, well, I'm praying that somebody steps up with a lot of money and writes a check. Not going to happen that way. Probably going to require 4,000 people just doing what God asked them to do. And it's scary for me. I hate doing building campaigns and funds. It drains the life out of me. I hate it. And here's the reality. If everybody in our church just tithed, we wouldn't even have to do a building fund. So God knows what's next, but he's gonna, it's going to require all of us. So life is quick. Do you know the earth is spinning around the sun right now at 6,000 miles an hour? We're going to be in eternity in like two seconds. 50 years, probably most of us will not be here. What kind of legacy will you leave? What will you be known for? God, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Would you go ahead and stand to your feet? I want to invite Andy Ortega to come to the front. Andy and Jill were the couple that helped us start our church 21 years ago. They were at the first service. They're an amazing, amazing couple. And I've asked Andy to come up and, and close us in prayer. So here's how it's going to go down. You're going to hold somebody stand next to you, even if you don't like them that much. And we're going to go ahead and bridge the aisles. Andy's going to pray. After his prayer, we're going to sing one last song, and then you can run out and get food and jolly jumps and all that stuff. Just go ahead and bow your heads, and would you close your eyes, and let's agree with this prayer. So before you bow your head, can you just take one look around? Just, just look. Take a look at God's goodness, your brothers and your sisters. Now take a look again. This time look with the eyes of faith. Not what God has done, but what, can, what God can do. You know, Pastor Steve opened the sermon with, I remember. And I remember too, but God remembers. This is Paul's prayer to the church of Thessalonica. We remember before our God and Father, your work produced by faith, 
your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. We became imitators of us, the Lord, and you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering and with joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Acacia. And the Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Acacia, your faith in God has become known everywhere. Father, we thank you for what you've done. We thank you as we look around and we see our eyes of faith and we remember and you remember the words you had for us, that you would give us the keys to the city, that you would export not only crops from Oxnard to all the world, but you would rex export your word. So thank you, Lord God, that you have been faithful to your word. Lord God, do it again, do it again, do it again, do it again. And by faith, Lord God, we commit to give by faith, Lord God, we commit to grow. By faith, Lord God, we commit to give, to give all that we are, all that you are. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.